Hi there, my name is Justin Laymiller. I am author of the blog Sex and Psychology and the book Tell Me What You Want. And I am joined today again by Joan Price uh, via Skype, who's going to be talking to us a little bit more about sex and aging. And specifically, we're gonna talk today about how you can allow your sex life to age gracefully. And Joan is someone who um, knows a lot about this. She's written several books on the subject of sex and aging, uh, including the award-winning book Naked at Our Age um, and her most recent book, The Ultimate Guide to Sex After 50. She also runs a popular blog on uh, sex and aging called Naked at Our Age, which you can visit at nakedatourage.com. So hi, Joan. Thanks for joining me again. Hi, Justin. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about aging gracefully with respect to your sex life. So um, I think maybe a good place to begin is sort of what are the benefits of maintaining an active sex life in older age? Why is it good to, to continue uh, to, to be sexually active? Well, regular sex is not only wonderful and exhilarating and feels good and joyful, but it has health benefits. In my book, The Ultimate Guide to Sex After 50, I listed 33 reasons why sex is good for you. And they include things like reduces stress, enhances mood, strengthens the immune system, helps fight infection and disease, lowers diastolic blood pressure, uh, keeps sex organs healthy, improves blood flow, helps with sleep, aids in healing wounds, helps prevent vaginal atrophy. Well, that's just the first ones. I don't want to bore everybody by listing all of them, but they're all in here. And besides that, I can't think of any good reason to give it up. I mean, help me if there's a good reason, but I can't think of any. Right. Sex changes, yes. We may need to adjust what we think of as sex and how we express ourselves sexually, but that doesn't mean we give sex up. Mm -hmm. I mean, sex is lifelong. Right. It's a wonderful gift that, our, that we can experience sexual pleasure and orgasm lifelong. And, and it's not just good for us physically, it may also be good for our relationships, right? Well, so absolutely. Can it's you talk a little for, about those benefits well, too? Well, yeah, it's good for intimacy. Uh, it, you know, when sex goes away, and so often I hear from my readers who say that sex is, has gone away in their relationship, but they didn't just one day sit down to breakfast and say, you know what, I think we're, we're done with that, okay, sure. It doesn't work that way. It works that one partner retreats from sex and the other one says, wait a minute, I didn't sign on for this having a termination date. Wait, can we talk about it? Or they don't dare talk about it or it becomes a real, um, a real negative force in their relationship that one person feels done with sex and the other one doesn't. And the reasons for feeling done with sex are, uh, are, there are myriad reasons. And one can be where someone just doesn't feel desire anymore. And, and that doesn't have to be the end of sex. That can be the beginning of understanding what responsive desire is instead of spontaneous desire. And I know mm -hmm. you know all about that. And a lot of people as they age, they don't know about that. They're, they don't have a, a way to learn about that. No one taught them about that, but it's so important. Or maybe sex as the, we used to know it doesn't work so well. Um, the vagina doesn't, doesn't enjoy penetration quite so much, or the penis doesn't get erect as easily or stay erect as long. But that's the beginning of a new kind of education. We need sex education after 50, 60, 70 mm -hmm. that teaches us that there are many ways to have sex. There are mm -hmm. many ways to express ourselves sexually and to just hold on to this way doesn't work anymore. Therefore, we're done is so limiting and negative and impacts our relationship, impacts how we see ourselves, impacts everything about our lives, really. Right. And, and what you said about we need sex ed for people 50, 60, 70, we also need yeah. sex ed for younger people, too. Yes, uh, we do. We, we are in a, a sorry state of, of sex education right now. So I'm, I'm for sex ed for all, for all ages. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, 
Um, and the only reason I say we need sex ed for seniors instead of for everyone is that people don't see us as sexual beings Absolutely. as we get older yep. and think, well, and, and people, in fact, laugh. Even people of my age laugh about that. Well, if they don't think we've learned to have sex when we've been having sex for 50 years, then, I mean, come on, Joan, what are you talking about? No, it's, it isn't that we need to learn what we learned 50 years ago, which wasn't sex ed anyway mm -hmm. it was sex fear it was reproductive ed maybe or was why you shouldn't have sex that's what we learned i mean come on right. we did not ever have good sex ed but i could talk for way too long about that so i'll <laughs> shut up about it well um one other thing i wanted to add with respect to the benefits of sex and aging is i've also seen some recent research suggesting that maintaining an active sex life in older age may actually be good for your brain in terms of benefiting yes. your memory um and they're both human and animal studies that support this where for example they found that uh rats that um, are permitted to engage in frequent sexual activity show more neuron growth um, versus rats that are um, denied the, the opportunity to, to mate, um, they show less of that growth. And then in the, the human studies, they've looked at um, uh, older adults over, uh, I believe it was over age 50 in one of the most recent studies I was looking at, and they found that um, those individuals who were more sexually active um, had better performance on memory tasks. So sex might be good for our brain. Wow, so when you say sex, are you talking about orgasms? Are you talking about sexual interaction? So what did they study there? So in that study, they defined it broadly. So that encompassed mm -hmm. all forms of uh, sex, you know, in terms of how people defined it. And I believe it also even included masturbation. Uh, so, so it took a very, a very broad definition there. Oh, that's good, because part of what I teach is that solo sex is real sex. Is and we sex? were not taught that when we were young. Sorry, can you say it again? Solo sex is... Solo sex is real sex. Oh, yes, yes. Absolutely. So, um, so, so we've talked a bit about the benefits of maintaining an active sex life um, yeah. while aging. So, so what can you do to prepare yourself, um, either physically or, or mentally, to, to try and keep that going uh, as, as you get older? Have regular orgasms. And if you feel, if you're not in the mood, realize it doesn't have to depend on the mood. It can depend just on getting started and getting the physiological uh, response to start. That's responsive desire instead of, um, instead of spontaneous desire, as I mentioned earlier. It can be having uh, even, <laughs> this will sound silly to many people, but scheduling orgasms. Mm -hmm. scheduling them a few times a week, mm -hmm. putting them on the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> and, and is there an alert that comes up and says it's time for an orgasm? Well, you, we all have to-do lists, right? Yeah. Put that on your to-do list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because the more you do it, the more you'll want to do it, the more your body will expect to do it. Mm -hmm. And as we get, at, when we're young and the hormones take care of that, it, it we think, well, why do we need to do that? My hormones tell me, it's, let's have sex again. But when we get older and those hormones recede and we don't get those messages from our hormones, we need to have other messages we get. And part of that is if we just expect to have sex, then our bodies will kick in, much as when we were younger and we had a hot date coming up, Part of what got us aroused was that anticipation. We thought about it for days. We planned it. We planned our dress, our grooming, our our sense, our, <laughs> our schedule, our wash, even doing the laundry, making sure our sheets were clean. This was all part of the anticipatory sexual arousal, right? But when we get older, and maybe we've been living with someone for 60 years, we may not have that. So if we schedule sex and then plan the anticipation, say, okay, I may even feel like it now, but I'm going to wait until our Thursday afternoon date because um, that will just make it that much hotter, mm -hmm. our Thursday afternoon date. We also want to plan to have sex before a meal, not after, mm -hmm. and after exercise mm -hmm. because all of that 
will increase the blood flow to the genitals. And we need that extra boost of increasing the blood flow to the genitals. I may have gotten off on a tangent. I don't know <laughs> if I'm still answering your question. But these are such important things to right. know. And they are, they are things that we're not taught. No right. one tells us this. Absolutely. Um, so, so are there any other tips or advice or recommendations you might offer to people um, on, on this issue? Plenty of lube and a variety of sex toys. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes a well-chosen, well-placed sex toy can mean the difference between orgasm and no orgasm. Right. We need extra arousal. We need extra stimulation. And <laughs> God's joke at this point is just when we need more time in stimulation, we get our arthritic wrists. <laughs> right. How is that fair? <laughs> right. Well, yes, you, you make so many excellent points. And um, uh, that's so much great advice. And um, I, I really appreciate your recommendations here. So thank, thank you, you so much for, for talking to me some more about sex and aging. And um, for any of you who are interested in learning more about this subject, um, I encourage you to check out Joan's blog, nakedatourage.com. Uh, and, and also check out some of her books too. And by the way, I have a book that's out recently as well. It's called Tell Me What You Want. And Joan recently read it. So oh my can gosh. you share any thoughts it on so it? It is so important, Justin. It is so important. Fantasies are like this dark area where no one wants to admit it and, and everybody worries. Um, am I sick because I have this really weird fantasy? Am I sick because I, what gets me off is something I don't want to do in real life, but it is just the only thing I want to think about? Um, and you've normalized all that. You've, you, and you not only have you presented such excellent research information, oh my God, I could talk forever <laughs> about your book, but you present it in such a friendly way. It's like you're sitting across the kitchen table from us and you're saying, hey, listen, here's what I learned about sexual fantasies. Do you want to hear it? And I just love that. You don't talk as a scientist, although you are a scientist. And that's so important that you're able to do that. Um, I love it. I love that book and I love the work you do, Justin. Well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate those kind words. Um, and, and also one, one other thing I would say about the book is that, you know, I was surveying people about their sexual fantasies, thousands of them. And um, I also included a lot of people who are in their 60s, 70s and, and 80s uh, in that thank survey. You. Because our sexual fantasies don't shut off when we reach a certain age. No. And um, just as younger people might be worried and concerned and anxious about their sex fantasies, you got the same issues among um, older adults as well. So uh, fantasies are, are an issue that I think all of us are interested in and curious about. And so I was happy to have the opportunity to try and shed more light on that topic for, for everybody. Did you find that sexual fantasies changed as we aged? Absolutely. Uh, th and there were a lot of interesting things. Um, uh, and I think kind of what's going on there is that as we age, our bodies change, our psychological needs are changing, and I think our fantasies are changing to adjust to that. Uh, yeah. so, so for example, um, with respect to say threesomes and group sex, uh, what I find in the research is that interest in, the, in, in group sex increases up until about age 40, where it stays high until the mid 50s, and then it starts to decline again, which I think makes a lot of sense when you think about sort of the developmental time course most people take, where you know in the early, early years, sex is, itself is just a novel novelty, sex with anyone is, is new and exciting. Yeah. You don't need to have a whole group to make it exciting. Um, yeah. But then people mostly enter long-term monogamous relationships. They crave novelty. And I think group sex is one way that people uh, seek to augment their sex life. And then as they get older, um, maybe that novelty is, is maybe a little less important because maybe their bodies are changing, their needs are changing. And so- um, Or we've other, tried it all. Or they've tried it all. Uh, so, so other things might become more appealing at that point too. So I think it's super fascinating. This is something I want to do at some point is uh, just do a whole research project looking at the developmental time course of sex fantasies Ooh, and how they evolve oh my God. and change over the lifespan. <gasps> I'd love that. Yeah. Oh, that would be so interesting. And, and so needed in terms of just better enhancing our understanding of sexual fantasies and desires. Yes. Yes. I can help you get hold of some seniors for that. Uh, I will probably take <laughs> you up on that offer. <laughs>
<laughs> so, well, thank you so much again, Joan, um, for your positive comments about the book and your support, and also um, for being here to talk to me more about sex and aging, and hopefully we can do it again sometime. I would love that. And thanks for asking. We love it when you ask us. Great. Thank you. <laughs>